and they are going to present. I think it's Michelle Jona also is joining us at this moment. Uh, she is the head of the archives at the Catholic University in Peru. Uh, so we are ready to start. I'm sorry, I have a, a, a problem with my computer, so I will be at the phone for a few minutes more. Uh, um, so we can start with Isabel, then Michelle, and then Lucia and Maria Cristina Cabral uh, for the presentations. So Isabel, if you're gonna start. Okay, thank you so much, Horacio, and hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I want to read um, a, a presentation about the archive of the Museum of Solidarity from 1971 and 1973. Um, we know that uh, Museo de la Solidaridad or Museum of Solidarity is a singular attempt to reconcile the conflict group of art and politics. The Museo de la Solidaridad was the materialization of President Salvador Allende's ideas on artistic visibility in relation to the shared agendas of two projects. The cultural intent of socialists in Chile and the new experimental model of the museum. Wait a minute, I want to put some images for you. I want to compare with you. Thank you. The geniality of the Museum of the Solidarity had in this road, in the symbolic representation of a state policy reflected in its, in its international organization, this is its national institutionalism, as well as its international symbolic role to globally project the success of the social, industrial, and cultural transformation transformation, sorry, undergone by the country during the Gobierno de la Unidad Popular, Popular Unity Government, led by President Salvador Allende. This was, uh, this was possible largely due to the Brazilian art critic Maria Pedrosa's social and ethical committees towards an experimental museographic proposal, which involved participating in the, in the foundation of a unique museum based on the word solidarity. Allende and Pedrosa's experimental museum project was left unfinished as a consequence, like we know, of the military coup of September 11, 1973. In while the surviving documents from this period act as footprints of an interrupted conversation, the story they tell that the museum, but also of the people ideas behind it, such as the openness and pluralism of social change, which was in line with the nature on the social and political model that Chile was experimenting with. Uh, experimenting. Words like solidarity, fraternity, revolutionary, experimental, and defined against imperialism and colonialism, resonates strongly among international artistic circles, as well as a more broader context. People from around the world contribute works, ideas, and connection towards the shaping of a network of culturally related workers and ultimate anism that was not hierarchical, but transversal and polyphonic. Moreover, they helped foster a radical imagination for a participatory museum, sorry, for a participatory museum. Conceived from the South, which combined the international culture community to be part creatively and critically of the problem of the profound transformations that Chile was experiencing by the decision of its people. In 1972, Chilean folk singer Angel Parra wrote a song titled 
listening for a computer and a baby about to be born. The son of Violeta Parra, one of the most important musicians in Chile for her contribution to, uh, to the rescue of traditional popular music that we know, Climate with Song was written after and inspired by a long conversation held with Britain, British cybernetic theorist Stafford Beer in Santiago de Chile between 1970s and 1972. The Baby About to be Born was an all allusion to the computer from Project CyberSync and the environment of division and internal resistance that permeated the country during the governments of President Salvador Allende. In Project CyberSync, the scientific idea of lead data feed was transferred to the political discourse of democracy and participation. participation. The process of technological modernization in the sectors of production and service was spearheaded by the state institutions like Intec and Corfo. This proposes a complex framework of contextual and epistemological transfer of technology and design in the development of social and cultural transformation in Chile between 1971 and 1972, which places the country on the geopolitical map of in this on the geopolitical map of industrial and technological innovation in the management of the economy. This in turn attracted other personalities from different fields to participate in the experimentation that Chile was leading when the socialist government of Salvador Allende. Nevertheless, since the beginnings of the Allende's government, the experimental and revolutionary exercise of the Via Chilena Socialismo, Chilean Road to Socialism, had been under attack by country media strategies from the right wing press, which emphasizes information about shorted strikes and privatization in the process led by Salvador Allende. In this context, the lyrics of Parra, the baby awam, the baby's about to be born, the baby about to be born, the, the lyric of Parra, Angel Parra, acted as a vehicle for broadcasting the achievements of the Unidad Popular in a time of political polarization. <laughs> Within the local context, Allende's opposition dominated major media outlets with the large circulations. Hence, Salvador Allende, Stanford Vieras Parra knew that in order to have Chilean society incorporate the change that this revolutionary technological shift, sorry, technological shifts meant, poets and folk authors were fundamental for transmitting to the people the new tools of the social transformation of the public policies of Allende's government. Operación Verdad, Operación Truth, was the implementation of a communication strategy for the state of Chile that had the objective of broadcasting to the world the positive developments of the first year of democratically elected socialist government. Two fundamental uh, milestones operate under this communication strategy. The third session of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNTA 3, and the Museo de la Solidaridad. They were based on open invitation to international personalities to visit the country and see for themselves the change that Chile was experiencing under the government of Salvador Allende. The purpose was spreading in the foreign media a reality that was considered to be distorted by the local news. The urgency in view of this tense political situation and the resistance to the national and overseas boycott implied that monumental action demanded tremendous efforts. The UNCATRES, as well as the Museo de la Solidaridad, championed invention and flexibility to effectively carry out the epic negotiation processes to bring forward two large scale projects. On the one hand, the design a constitution of a building with, in which to receive international representative of economy and international trade. 
On the other, the creation of a collection and international wisdom in a similar amount of time. With the objective of recognizing and making visible the support received from the international cultural community in the development of socialism in Chile, renowned intellectual, intellectuals were invited to join the Comité Internacional de Solidaridad Artística con Chile, CISAC, International Committee for Artistic Solidarity with Chile. The Comité had the objective to call open the artists of the world to build with the donation of their work an important international collection and a museum for the people of Chile, having as a fundamental gesture the donation of the piece by the artists themselves or all artworks with the diverse styles, origins, and aesthetic values will be united under the same cultural action and symbolic concept. International solidarity. Following this strategic line, guided by the state and managed for the International Committee for Artistic Solidarity with Chile, was born. On November 1971, as a response to donations already comprised, CISAT Executive Committee clarified the white line of the project in five points on a document titled Needed Declaration. It established that the donation of artwork by worldwide renowned artists sympathizing, uh, sympathizing with Allende's government and with the revolutionary for reforms taking place in Chile. It declared that it was the whole place that on the Chilean way to socialism what had motivated culture related workers worldwide to give away the fruits of their creative power without political partisanship nor sectors. The member of CISAR, through their management, had to propose suite of artists, contact them and encourage them to support the initiative by the donation of artwork for the music. The embassies from the Ministry of Elect uh, Exterior Relation will be in charge of transporting, uh, sorry, transporting the artwork to Chile, while the committee had to receive and register the artworks that arrived. Among the members of CISAC, Comité International Solidarity, was Brazilian art critic Mario Pedrosa, who led the donation process for an important part of the collection's artwork. Pedrosa uh, had arrived in Brazil in 1970, seeking political asylum in Chile through the Chilean embassy, and later established as a research and academic at the Facultad of Fine Arts of University of Chile, and within the recent formal committee, uh, the main operation center in, of CISAC. Um, it was because of Pedrosa's influence that avant-garde artists in Rio de Janeiro were united as Group Frente, Front Group in 1948, to develop their own form of geometrical abstraction. Uh, he was the mentor of this group between the year 1960s and 70s, when this art is simulated by his critical vision, moved for, uh, from formal abstraction to create participatory experiments. This new vision marked the beginning of arte participativo, participatory art, an international phenomenon that is still present in debates about contemporary artistic creation. Pedrosa had been prosecuted in Brazil in 1917 by the military dictatorship of General Emilio Garazzo Medici under accusation of def uh, defending Brazil in front of foreign countries, but denouncing the tortures and human rights violation committed by the regime. In this moment, around 100 intellectuals and artists around the world among which figures like Pablo Picasso, Henry Moore, and Alexander Calder come together to sing a letters against Pedrosa's persecution directly to General Medici. With this experience, arts, and its relationship with propaganda, 
were discussed at a cultural and artistic meeting in Santiago de Chile in 1972. For Pedrosa's folk song, like Parra song, as well as the media, were central tools to support the revolutionary movement, or as he puts it in a wrong term representation in this committee in Santiago in 1972. 71, sorry. He said, can the pluralists on the artistic field allow without contradiction the socialists propose to block that fight at least literally and formally on a propagandistic and informative level? Art today is no more a privileged media of plastic expression solely, but also a formidable tool to communicate with people at all for irrevocable information. There is no truly stable uh, compartmentalization between countries within today's world. The big and the small are in full crisis, institution, institutionally as well as culturally. There is no fight, one place that doesn't end up leading to the other one or connected with the rest of them. The lectures sent by Mari Pedrosa between 1971 and early 1973 in the context of Operación Verdad to a group of selected artists among other intellectuals and music directors worldwide tell the story of an unpublished project and program. It was based on the premise of a museum that will uh, permanently store and exhibit all the works of the collection under an integration program oriented towards a new Chilean audience. During Operation Verdad, Operation Through, which took place in Chile 1971, an initiative was launched in international art related media to promote the domination of representative artwork that could serve as the basis for the creation of Museo of Modern and Experimental Art for Chile. When considering the significance of such history crucial for Chile and its government, a group of intellectuals decided to form a committee that we know and put in act uh, a given historical moment that Chile is beginning to the two, in which unorganic, gradual, and profound transformation towards a socialist society is taking place, in which democracy had to be perfected. Simultaneously, in invigorating the freedom of creation and expression that are the most typical features of the process. A museum of modern art in Chile has to be a exemplary in the museography methods, methods and in this cultural and educational purpose. Uh, we can read in this archive from Mario Pedrosa the, corre the correspondence between Mario Pedrosa and close collaborations that as a, our critic Dor Ashton of the United States. And Sorry? Could you please go ahead with your with your slides? Uh, I think you are you are stop in in one of the slides. Okay, it's not going going in ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I understand. I open it. Open it like this one. The Thank you. Um, the correspondence between Pedrosa and close collaborators such as uh, art critics Dora Ashton of the United States and Arasi de Amaral of Brazil reported that the museum's collection aimed at having prominent name during, during its first stage in order to, on one hand, fulfill the symbolic communication objective of Person Verdad. On the other hand, this will allow the museum as a certain freedom to, su to summon other type of work and artistic expression that will be enable the integration and eventual dissolution of the categories 
and hierarchies of the future collection of the Museo de la Solidaridad, as well as the political, the politics of the space that these artworks will propose to the specters on their experience within the museum. On conversation via lectures and telefax with art friends, the artwork for this collection will represent different artistic lines and discourse about the function of art and its active role within society and specifically in the social context of Chile at the time. For Pedrosa, the Museum of Modern and Experimental Art was a concrete example of the participation of developing country in the international artistic heritage. This was a epitome of the third world in its fight against submission. Isabel, there are yes. no slides now. We are uh, not seeing your slides. To, one slide in this one, sorry. The last one was the, the, um, the slide with um, the Eleven project, yeah, okay. Stella. Yes, yeah. That one, yes. Thank you. It's OK? It's not moving now? No. Okay. It's not moving, I think. It's... it's OK, no? You can see well? Yeah, we, we can see the whole presentation with, with all the slides at the at the the left, not as, as a, uh, now, now it's okay. Thank ah, you. Thank you. So okay. This is a uh, sketches from Solid, Solid and Pedrosa, you can see. It's a, it's a, a document, but, but it's a project, it's a manifest, uh, it's a conversation uh, between the artist and the critic, you know? in one sketch. Um, in another lecture in relation with this archive, uh, with paper, in, in a paper with the letterhead of Documenta 5, Harold Simon, curator of the legendary edition of the well-known exhibition of contemporary art held uh, every five years in Kassel, Germany, grow to artist John Baldessari, another really famous artist. Mari Pedrosa, he said, the art critic and Brazilian curator, is now in Chile to found a museum of solidarity among artists and the experiment of country Chile itself. Around 600 art pieces have already arrived to Chile, among them the works of Miro, Calder, Vasarelli, and Estela. Mario Pedrosa has me to send the, his petition to the artist of Documenta 5 and the painter and sculptor that I know to help him create a movement for the Solidarity Museum through art piece and the creation of a collection that on its own puts defeat the construction of a new building. I would appreciate that you could collaborate in this project with your ideas and support. Best regard, Harold Simon. On the same lecture, written over a continuous strip on paper and formatted from California, US, Baldessar incorporated his response. Dear Maria Pedrosa, please let me know what can I do to help with the creation of your mission and how do I start to do it sincerely, John Baldessari? Harold Simon's motivation for advocating for Mari Pedrosi Museum in Chile could be read as a part of well known interest in the experimental, as shouted by the theoretical and intellectual climate of his time. Furthermore, it could also be the assertive, challenging, and open possibility transmitted to him and to the community of international artists and friends by Pedrosa himself. The solidarity message will mean to assume as a critical and artistic challenge from a social and ethic commitment. It is possible to relate both Thinan and Pedrosa by means of a certain fascination with an open and flexibility spatiality on the understanding of culture, 
as well as on the transversality of artists and artworks and view in the exhibition that it uh, had previously organized. As it is well known, both Thiemann and Pedrosa were deeply invested in cutting across hierarchical categories of art and by extension of culture within their work. The Museum of Solidarity was meant as the creation of a platform by artistic visibility, as well as for the practice of President Salvador Allende's popular unity government in relation to the shared agendas of both projects, the cultural transformation of socialism and the new experimental model of the museum. The building that we was expected to house the experimental museum and its collection along with developing more open and experimental works was the Parque Causeño building, constructed during the government of Pedro Aguirre Cerda, president from the Frente Popular, who had worked towards the advancement of education and the deservers of the human goods. By September 1973, when the military coup attempt uh, took place, the Museo de la Solidaridad still had no definitive building to hold its collection, nor the experimental museographies, uh, museographies that Pedrosa had anticipated in his invitation to the artists. Now that the Museo de la Solidaridad Salvador Allende, the actual museum, the actual collection contains approximately 2,800 artworks. Um, in English, number is, Horacio, can you help me? 2,800? 2,000. 2,000. Oh, so. 200,000. Ah, 200, yeah. I have. 100,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not going place. again. Huh? Your presentation is gone. No, it's not going ahead. We are still at the Sol Levit, uh, you know, uh, you understand me? Sorry. Sorry, what, Horacio? I'm finished. Yes, it's not going ahead, your presentation. It's not going ahead. We are we are staying at the, at the Sol Levit, uh, project. Yeah, yeah, we have this ah, image. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, I know. No, I finish it. Okay, sorry. Uh, tell you that this museum was not possible to build, you know, in this definitive uh, building for the Museo, Experimental Museo de Mario Pedrosa. And today we have a, another museum, you know, uh, the word solidarity as a tool of meaning and action of a unique international public artistic project motivated by enthusiasm change its meaning as well as its purpose, you know, for the museum today. The model of the Museo de la Solidaridad in its internal years of exile during the dictatorship irrevocably changed its meaning, the activists, political, and art instances that use the world now deriving its meaning from support, Com uh, companionship and camaraderie, resistance against the loss after the social dis uh, displacement carried out of the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Mm -hmm. um, the project of the museum to which Mario Pedro Salud does not refer to a fixed program, but to one that is a dynamic and flexible. Its development started from exchange with artists and theories that gave way to the script through the continuous dialogue of letters and stickers, like so Levit image that we can see now. These artworks are not cataloged in the collection because of their immaterial characters. Yet from the letters of intent of the artists to Mario Pedrosa and the art of donation that exist on the museum archives, we can infer and witness explicit things of the extensive understanding of the project, of the project's original epic narrative. In this way, the experience of a music that was developed in a, collabor in a collaborative and organic way between 1971 and September 1973 in Chile evidence the pressing need to reevaluate and expand the notion left by modernism, which establishes the limits 
and scopes of this practice of collections and museum audience based on colonial model. Uh, furthermore, it's always asked to understand museums as a complex device, as cultural science, and as a dynamic agent of social transformation. More than just containers or value objects, museum today should be understood as a place like the Rosa Zone, that enable a unique connection and relationship between individuals, groups, and communities. Thank you. I think that I can finish this presentation here. Um, Horacio? I don't listen to you. Okay. Thank you, Isa. I think it's so exciting your your work on on the solidarity museum and also very very related with the with the figure of Mario Pedrosa we are two guests uh, from from Brazil but he he was very well known the, uh, here so uh let me introduce now Michel Jona Michel is uh, um professor and, and she's in charge of the archives of the Catholic University in Lima, Peru. Michelle, go ahead when, when you want, please. Good morning. Thank you, Horacio. Um, today I will present part of a curatorial project with uh, a collection of a Peruvian architect uh, called Jose Garcia Brais. Um, I will also have to read today, but um, um, well. Garcia Brais began his architectural studies in 1946 at the Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería, where he obtained a degree in engineering with a specialization in architecture. During his early years of study, the School of Architecture underwent a radical transformation for moving away from Beaux-Arts education to embrace the ideas and form of the modern movement. At that time, a group of young professors of architecture, Fernando Belaun de Terry, Luis Mero Quesada, Juan Benitez, Enrique Seoane Ross, and Paul Linder, joined the university, and with them, modern architecture quickly began to spread out. The, mod the models were no longer Palladio's or Vignola's book, but rather Le Corbusier, Niemeyer, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Freshly graduate, Garcia Brais spent three years traveling through Europe when he began his studies in art history. What started as a trip to explore Italian design turned into an opportunity to teach architectural history at the university. This opportunity motivated him to take courses in art history as a free student in Rome, Munich, and Paris. He later complemented these studies in 1963 with a master's degree in scholars uh, in art history at Harvard University, supported by a Fulbright scholarship and under the guidance of Professor James Ackerman. By the mid 50s, now settled in Lima, he early, his early works make it a clear line professional development. In 1966, he published his first article, Neoclassicismo y Arquitectura Republicana, in the magazine El Arquitecto Peruano. In 1957, he took up a position of professor of art and architectural history at the Facultad de Arquitectura in the Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería. At the same year, he worked at the National Council of for conservation and restoration of artistic and architectural monuments. And a few years later, and the Junta Deliberante Metropolitana, where he was involved in assessment and evaluation of colonial and Republican buildings. In 1960, he began practices and 
as an independent architect, a role he will share for 50 years with the architect Miguel Angel Llona. We will too list a longer series of work by Garcia right here, but this will not fully reflect his role as a key figure in the cultural history of Peruvian and Latin American architecture. Uh, forget over more than 60 years of continuous work. In 2016, Garcia Bryce began the lengthy process of closing his office, which allowed us access to his archive and thus to jointly review his documents and professional trajectory. The document collection of Jose Garcia Bryce was donated by the architect in 2017 to the architectural ICAC of the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. The images that I, that I am showing today represent a story told through architectural documents. It focuses on demonstrating their value as evidence of the inherent intellectual activity in the project as tangible and conceptual proof of a narrative establishing a parallel between the constructed work and the documents, plans, perspectives, photographs, articles, and essays. We select nine of these productions and gather them in a chronological narrative that allows glimpses into the evolution of these thoughts. We are presenting here um, three works of soul authorships as a project without association that reveal like a pure design, inaltered by other influences. A color collaborative project uh, work as a project of generation or architect proposing a new vision. And a set of light of teaching, uh, which bring us closer to a personal and systematic record of Peruvian architecture. In search of dialogue and to achieve this interpretation of the document and idea handled by Garcia Bryce, we reviewed the, uh, the selected material with other architects and artists. We invite individuals who uh, had some connection, personal, professional, academic, or platonic with Garcia Bryce, to review a select set of documents from the archive and to propose hypotheses about the compiled work. So the exhibition is called Jose Garcia Bryce, Collection for a History of Peruvian Architecture. And I made this investigation. Um, Exploraciones para el Centro Histórico de Lima. Exploration for the Historic Center of Lima. In 1966, in collaboration with Gian Felice Fogliani, an Italian architect, he produced a series of graphic essay. Uh, I titled, I, I'm, I put the name, Exploraciones para el Centro Histórico de Lima, presented in an exhibition. This creative series includes three drawings, each using a different technique, an ink perspective highlighting a colored balcony, um, a collage uh, combining photography and drawing to project both the existing and the imagined, and a watercolor presenting consolidated image. This work explored the interactive interaction between the historical and modern city, using as technique as a mean for critical thinking and visual narrative. This drawing highlighted the dialogue between the history and the modern, suggesting a, pro a progressive narrative in the essay from a historical representation in the drawing through a collage that blends both periods and a watercolor where the history and modern merge. Garcia Rice's works become a reflection on the past and the present and the future of Lima, demonstrating his skills in weaving history in the modern urban fabric. Alvarez Calderon Building. Uh, this building, designed by Jose Garcia Bryce in 1963, is an iconic work in Peruvian architecture. Located in a residential neighborhood of Lima, this apartment building was awarded um, 
awarded the Chavin Prize or Premio Chavin by the Ministry of the Culture, uh, a high honor for a young uh, 30, 35 year old Garcia Bryce, uh, two young, uh, very young architects. A detailed review of document include plans and photograph of the billboard, reveal the evolution of Garcia Bryce project's ideas. The building represents a moment, moment of urban densification in an area of single family homes. Garcia Bryce ad addressed this by maintaining a domestic scale through setback and intermediate, intermediate height. It is noticeable the building independence from the lot, but by the combination of typologies. The design process shows significant change from the preliminary project to the final version. Initially, the building had a classical composition with internal light, uh, internal light courts. In the final version, the courts were removed, illuminating the apartment only by the perimeter and creating a common light court. This was achieved by separating the main and the service and the services there. The elevated tank, first tested by Garcia Bryce, became a sculptural element that highlights the entrance to the building. We can also highlight the regularity of the portico structure and attention to the detail, revealing a percent of manufacturing process. A notable detail is the window that projects slightly out of the facade, adding richness to a rational design. This project became uh, this project marked the beginning of Garcia Bryce's distinctive architectural language, integrating elements of Peruvian constructed traditions such as galleries, courtyard, balconies, and elevated tanks. Since then, the, his ability to compositionally combine structure, program, and form establishes his own style, and his housing project is evident. The Lima Civic Center. Uh, architect Jose Garcia Braz, known for his active participation in competition, reached a milestone in his career by winning the 1966 competition for the Lima Civic Administrative and Commercial Center. This project carried out with a team of distinguished Peruvian architects was framed is the, gov the government of Fernando Belaunde Ter, you know, the architect's president of Peru, seeking to connect the whole area uh, of Lima with the areas of Paseo de la República and the Parque de la Exposición. El Colegio de Arquitectos del Perú, uh, responsible for judging the competition, highlighted it in its verdict the dynamic volumetry and complexity of the co of the complex, solving its design with a confident, confident and homogeneous architectural language. The project document include including Garcia Bryce's sketches and perspective construct the initial idea with the team final proposal showing the evolution of concepts in form and materiality. Adolfo Córdoba, Guillermo Mala, and Osvaldo Núñez. Uh, it was a 10 architects team, and now we, are, we have only three architects alive, and we uh, have a, a, an investigation with them of this project. Uh, bueno, Córdoba, Mala, and Núñez, part of the team of the architects of the Civic Center, Reflect on the project idea and strategy 50 years after its contract constructions. They emphasize how the civic center integrates into the urban fabric of the city rather than imposing it itself as an isolated object. The original design contemplates a tower and a plaza in the north, opening toward the south with housing and a hotel. Although these la later elements were not realized in the final construction. Today, the Civic Center is considered an emblematic example of brutal architecture in Peru, 
characterized by its use of exposed concrete and robust expre expression. Despite this perception, the document and discussion underlying Garcia Bryce search for an organic unity using scales, proportion, and, uh, and traditional elements of Peruvian architecture, such as a continuous balcony. This approach reflects Garcia Rice's attempt to fuse modernity with Peruvian architecture roots, creating a space that not only responds to functional needs, but also respects the integrate with uh, the architectural and history, historical context of Lima. Um, the 10 architects divides the design of this civic center and Garcia Braz developed this um, sala de convencio auditory. No? Uh, my father made the, the tower. Uh, Adolfo Cordova and then uh, a slide for teaching. Uh, Jose Garcia Braz combi combined his professional career with a commitment to teaching the history of art and architecture for over 50 years. During this time, Bryce built, uh, uh, Garcia Bryce built a valuable photographic archive, mainly composed uh, of light, capturing the essence of architecture in Europe, United States, and Latin America, including his own nation, Peru. This archive transformed into a key, into a key pedagogical tool, reflect a meticulous process of collection and classification initiated during, during his first trip to Europe. Garcia Braz's collection presents a historical overview of Peruvian architecture, spanning from the pre-Hispanic era to modernity. His photograph taken during his travel throughout Peru adopt a methodology that combines the journey, collection, and categorization, offering a phenomenological view that connects architectural works with their geographical, social, and cultural context. This approach is particularly significant in Peru due to its geographical diversity, which break with the perception of a homogeneous territory and enrich the understanding of the different regional architectural expression. Over the years, especially in the 1970s, Garcia Braz visited multiple Peruvian regions as a part of his work on restoration projects and collaboration with institutions such as the Instituto Nacional de Cultura. These expeditions were crucial for the development of his archive, which not only serve as an educational tool, but also as an act of preservation in a country where architectural heritage faced constant threats. Garcia Rice archive stands out um, for its meticulous organization, its focus on seriality, allowing fair and detailed assessment of different work. This collection um, this collection not only facilitates the analysis of characteristic architectural element and their variation, but also helps to understand the proportion, uh, spatial qualities, and aesthetic and compositional value of architecture in Peru. Finally, Garcia Braz's archive, uh, housed in wooden cabinet designed by itself, not only represent an invaluable resource for teaching and research, but also question about inclusion and recording matter in architectural discourse, inviting future generation to continue and expand this legacy. The San Jose Chapel, located in the district of La Victoria in Lima, Peru, is a not notable work by the architect. Designed in 1977 for the Oblate Father of San Jose, this chapel earned um, to Garcia Braz the Hexagono de Oro a, a, a prize in 1981, uh, the highest rec recognition of the La Bienal de Arquitectura Peruana. 
Prior to this, he had designed and built the Iglesia de Nuestra Señora del Buen Consejo and La Catedral de Huacho. Situated on Avenida Aviación, the chapel designed design respond to the need to integrate with the neighborhood. It was organized, organized on two levels with a refectory in the ground floor and the chapel in the upper floor, orient east to west. Garcia Braz focusing on architectural form worked in a detail on the project. A highlight aspect of the chapel, Jose, San Jose Chapel, is the precision of construction and the use of light as a design element crucial in ecclesiastical architecture, relating them to the work we say that of Louis Grain. Lighting is achieved uh, through three skylights, with two smaller ones illuminating. Uh, the perimeter and a larger one focuses on the presbytery. The, uh, this arrangement creates a play of light, of shadow, and define the interior space. Garcia Braz, known for his expertise in Peruvian and ecclesiastical architecture, demonstrates his ability to merge historical and tradition, traditional knowledge with a modern architectural language and and in innovative approach to construction and design. The San Jose Chapel is an example of how ideas from a previous historical time can be reinterpreted, reinterpreted in a contemporary, contemporary context. Uh, Chabuca Granda housing complex is located in the historic, historic neighborhood of Alamelos Descalzos in the Rima district of, of Lima. Created in the 1980s to revitalize the area without altering its urban character, the project combined housing and commercial space, grouping 48 residents with two or three bedrooms surrounded on the ground floor by 14 commercial premises. Premises. During the inauguration uh, in 1944 with the president Fernando Belaun de Terry, praised its integration with the city, with city's historic architecture. Documentation of the project, including prelim preliminary uh, drawings, plan sections, elevation, photograph, and reveals Garcia Fry's uh, creative process. Um, 1983 study shows his exploration of solution for organizing housing, commons, patios, and parkings on the sites. The documents reflect strategies such as the use of continuous balcony and elevate water tanks. This work shows Garcia Bryce integrates traditional Peruvian housing typology, such as the Quinta, and the house patio into the design. The patio is the, like this square and the quinta is this long way. Um, Garcia Reyes approached the project irregular to lot through two models, no? the quinta and with concentrator with vertical circulation and the house patio mixing the commerce and the housing. In the later, he proposed an open street races on the second level, connecting two story houses instead of apartment. The designs promote community life and reinforce the semi-public nature of the complex. The Chabuca Granda housing complex stands out for its careful insertion into the urban context, maintaining the scale and the architectural language of the neighborhood. It designs dialogue with the Santa Liberata Church it face and employs continuous balcony as a reference of a colonial architecture. This, uh, these images uh, was taken in his house office. Archive and architect. 
Garcia Braiz, uh, a renowned Peruvian architect and histor historian, created a unique personal archive that served as a repository of Peruvian architectural memory. Throughout the 1960 and 1970, Garcia Braiz traveled across the country, meticulously documenting a wide range of structures through photographs from cathedral and church to pre Hispanic and sites of urban architectural detail. This archive contained in, in cabinet designed by him represent more than just a collection. It's a visual testimony of a nation built history. Located uh, within his office, this space is filled, filled with objects reflecting Garcia Braz's professional and personal life. Among book, draft essay, photograph, plans, drawing, and sketches, the accumulative nature of an architect's work is revealed. The collector approach extends throughout an architectural career, where each safe element can reemerge as a source of inspiration or retention at any moment. Architectural designs, being a non-linear and accumulative process, necessitates the preservation of a variety of creative inputs. Architect office, therefore, became accidental, accidental archive where the architect acts as a careful custodian of their legacy. And the case of Garcia Braz, his office transformed into a space of stationary time where each object materialized as an aspect of his life. Garcia Braz's legacy beyond his building extends through his archi archive offering a deep insight into his approach and contribution to Peruvian architecture. This archive not only preserved his work, but also became a vital tool for research and study, providing access to unpublished material for his most emblematic project. Furthermore, the archive inv uh, invites exploration beyond the visible surface, allowing for an expected discovery through a uh, cross, cross reading of the document. This exploration can reveal new geneal genealogies of known work and highlight absence in the country architectural history. Garcia Braz archive by opening to the public, not only let legitimize his memory, but also invites reinterpretation and a deeper understanding of Peruvian architecture. All Ultimately, this archive is not just a collection of documents, but as but as a space for ongoing discovery and reflection of the evolution of architecture. And um, this QR, uh, if you want to uh, go directly to the exhibition, is online. And we can we we will see all the images uh, and more information about Garcia Braz. And I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Horacio. Thank you, Michelle. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I think uh, Garcia Braz is very good, uh, a very interesting archive to explore. Um, so let me introduce now uh, Maria Cristina Cabral and Lucia Costa, who are going to, to present uh, the relation in between the archives, or, uh, already the archives and the project. I'm, I'm giving uh, their, them uh, the microphone, Cristina and uh, Lucia. Thank you so much for being here. And go ahead with your presentation. Here. <laughs> so can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes. Yes. So. Um, Good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, Rasu, I would like to thank you. We would like to thank you uh, for this invitation about a subject that is so crucial to us. 
My colleague, Lucia Costa and I, Christina, we are graduated at the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism, where we teach at the graduate, graduate program in urbanism. And today we will we'll explain to you some decisions to restore Bullamax Gardens for the university campus, spotted by the primary records at the ANPD's collection that have been driving the restoration. So first, I will introduce you to the, to the context, and then Lucia, as an urban designer uh, and Bullamax work researcher, will explain you to details about the restoration. So you change? The, the slide changes or not? No. No, it, no. no? Not yet. Why not? Because for me it's changed. Can you see the the first big one? Just the big one. No, not yet. Not yet. And now? Ah, uh, now yes, yes. Okay. Archipelago. Archipelago. The University okay. City of the University of Brazil in the then federal capital of the country was built on the ground of a group of islands, which are seen in this aerial photograph from 1945. Now it changes. I have two different controls to change. Uh, the urban design, the first buildings of the university city were designed by Jorge Machado Moreira and the university's technical office in the early fifties. Jorge Machado Moreira was part of the Brazilian team from the ministry project in 1936, together with Lucio Costa, Fonso Eduardo Luigi and Oscar Niemeyer. In this plan from 1968, we can see the urban plan of the university city with two buildings highlighted. On the left is the IPPMG from 1952. And on the right is the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism from 1960. And at that time, the National Faculty of Architecture. In both projects, the architecture was designed by a team coordinated by Jorge Machado Moreira, and the landscaping was coordinated by Roberto Bulemax. And almost all of the images presented here are part of the Research and Documentation Center of the Faculty of Architecture, the NPD, that will be introduced on the next slide. The NPD was created in 1982 and linked to the current Department of Architectural Design, bringing together professional and academic collections from members of the former National School of Fine Arts and later the National Faculty of Architecture. Currently, the collection has more than 300,000 documents with archival funds from more than, from more than 30 professionals with active and renowned offices from the 20th century. Most of these funds are available on the website for public consultation. Oops. The creator and first coordinator of the NPD was Professor George Tchaikovsky, as a central figure in the conception and implementation of the collections. We conceived the NPD based on a tripod center on the conservation, publication, and exhibition of the collections. His action began with the gathering of archives and, uh, and their conservation, expanded with the publication of Architectural Revista 
1983, at a time when in Brazil there are very few publications and research in architecture. The documents generating the foundation, design, and construction of the university city were part of the tech university, university's techni technical office, and since 2010, they have been in the NPD. The university city's collections has a total of 25,000 or original drawings, uh, 10,000 photographs, uh, 20,000 blueprints, and a lot of different text documents. 40,000 of which have already been digitized, digitized, digitized. It is the most constituted collection. From there, Lucia, in the research from, from her research group, were able to reconstruct the Bulemax, Bulemax projects that she will present now. Lucia? Thank you, Christina. Um, I would like to, I would also like to thank Horacio Torrent for this opportunity to share our experience of studying Bulle Max Gardens for the Faculty of Architecture and discuss the role of um, the NPD connection on it. Um, Bulle Max, um, as Christian explained, uh, Bulle Max designed uh, the landscaping of two buildings that were designed by Jorge Machado Murieta. And this connection it was a, an old connection. They were partners of uh, around eight commissions uh, joining architecture and landscape. And so Jorge Machado Moreira invited Bulle Max to work on the new university campus that was beginning in at that time. Next, please, Kishi. It's important to contextualize uh, Bulemak's work when he began to, 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 to design the landscaping of the Faculty of Architecture. At that time, he was already acknowledged as one of the most important names in landscape design. He was acknowledged internationally as a, an important landscape designer of, uh, from the mo modern movement. And uh, he, he, he designed two parks at the time, one in Venezuela, Parque de Les in Caracas in 1956, uh, and Parque do Flamengo in Rio de Janeiro in the 60s, exactly the same year he designed the, the gardens of Faculty of Architecture. It is important con to contextualize that since, as we will see, the gardens of the Faculty of Architectures, it has the scale of a small urban park. And also it's important to say that at that time, Bulle Max had um, invited four architects to join his office. Mauricio Monte, Julio Pessolani, Fernando Tabra, and John Stoddard. And this invitation was important in order to, uh, let's say, um, give a different direction to the way landscape that his to the way his office was designing was representing his landscape design projects. Christina, please, next. Now here we have the Faculty of Architecture building in 1960s. Um, it was placed in a block of its own at the university campus and the block was really huge around 101 was something like 17 hectares which as i said is the size of a small park it was um, one of the biggest blocks designated for just one building at the university christina these drawings uh, are drawings from Jorge Machado Moreira's office. And they are important to make clear that the building and the garden should have a visual relations. That is, 
wide space is open to the garden, especially on the two first levels. So this interwave between the building and the architecture was um, was paramount for the whole ensemble that makes the garden and the buildings. Next, please. Here we have the original master plans, Bulemax design, and a model that are important to explain us, to, to highlight how Bulemax um, approached this landscape design challenge. Um, as we can see, the building is placed uh, in around one third of the block, which leaves a smaller part of the garden facing the main street and the other part facing the other side of the, of the block. In conceptual terms, Bulemax divided the area in two parts. The smaller area in front of the in front of the main street, he designed ornamental gardens, courtyards, and five lakes. That is, creating geometric compositions between plants and the paving using plants of the same colors to design at the pedestrian scale. And we see the interwave between the strips, the colored strips of the gardens and the colored strips of the paving in the first part of the, on, on this first front part of the garden. For the other side, which is the largest part of the garden, Bulemax brought a completely new approach uh, concerning his other works. He designed areas that could be used as experimental gardens. That is areas where students and lectures would create, destroy, recreate, and so on, so they could learn by doing, ex experiencing, using different plants, stones, water, and other materials uh, with which we design open spaces. And for this end, he designed a, it is all structured through a pedestrian path, which is a geometric structure following the structure of the front garden. However, with different functions now, the garden here has both the areas for experimentation and also the equipment that gives support for this experimentation. Uh, for instance, plant nurses, nurseries where plants for different purposes and ecosystems could be cultivated, a small open air theater uh, for open air classes, a large square, um, with lakes at the top of the, the picture uh, displaying aquatic plants. And this was, in other words, this area, the, this garden area was designed as a plant display. It had a pedagogical approach, so to speak, for architecture students. The main part of this garden, its, its most important structure was the main plant nursery a very large building at the other entrance. Christina, the next, please. Next, please. Yes. Now the perspective, please. Um, this, the plant nursery is beautifully designed with six, with stones walls of six meters high and a covered area designed to be a working plant with plants. This building was so special for Bulemax that these are these two are the only perspectives he designed for the whole garden. Next. Um, this is the document Bule, uh, Buleva, uh, Bulemax handed in with the design with the garden documents. It lists all the 50 design documents informing the documents, they inform both the plants material as well as the paving materials, architecture details of the lakes, stairs, every detail that we need to, to have the gardens executed. And here we can see the influence of the four architects working with him 
bringing landscape design to an architectural world in terms of representation, which is completely different when we compare the design of the gardens of the first building, the, the hospital, uh, the EPPMG hospital that, that my colleague has shown in the first images. Next, please. And here we have, um, we choose one example of how we stood the, the archives, the, the collection of NPD. On the left, we have a we have one of the documents designed by Bole um, um showing the position of the plants on the three structures, the trees, palms, shrubs, and herbs. On the right, we can see the, the garden, the work in progress, let's say, uh, constructing the gardens. And this picture is amazing because it shows can we go back, please? Yes, this picture is so amazing because we can see the scale, the monumental scale of the gardens. When you take a look of a small figure, small white point and the, the group of people working in the garden, and there is a small, a single one in uh, at the other side, Christina, just one person with white, white clothes, yes. We can have an idea of the scale of the the project uh, at the time. Next, please. Also, here we have uh, one picture around the sixties on the left showing the um, the geometry of the grass, the dark one, and a uh, lighter one that Bulemax had already used in some of his gardens of the fifties. And on the right, we can see the uh, an aerial view of this this part of the garden already constructed, and to see to have an idea of the 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 block as a whole. Next, please. Here we can see what happened with the design. Unfortunately, the design was the landscape. Um, the landscape project for the uh, faculty gardens, they were not built in the hall. They were built only in the smallest part of the garden and in the biggest area, the largest area, the one that we would have the experimental gardens, experiential gardens, um, it's not, not, it was not built. So along the years, uh, it seems that the landscape the Bulemax project was forgotten and trees were planted everywhere, not taking into account the, neither the specification or the, the, the right place that Bulemax specified for the planting. And we can see how interesting it is because Bulemax did not place the trees very close to the building. Bulemax, on the other hand, he, ex he placed the trees a, a little bit far away from the building in order to allow a view of the architecture. And what happens now is that oh, the trees, all, all the big trees that we have, the majority of them, are comp they are uh, surrounding the building in such a way um, that we see that it doesn't allow us the a reading of the building as a whole. Next, please. Here we have um, some pictures of the, the gardens as they are today. It's important to say that this big, um, this huge concrete panel is also Burle Max contribution for the program. It was designed by Burle Max as well as part of the landscape, uh, the landscaping of the area. Um, the, the, the garden has been completely neglected along the years. We can see from these pictures that the, the lakes have no water and there is no maintenance. And so consider the, we have, we have a, in order to approach the, um, uh, the recovering of the garden and how we could update the garden consid considering the new uses of the building. Um, we've made a lot of studies studying the relationship of, from the, the building with the, uh, with the open spaces, studying how to recover the lake, since studying a lot of 
other aspects. But for today, we choose to show, to, to focus only on the on the plants, on the least plants that Bulemax uh, specified for the garden and how they could uh, highlight us, they could drive in a position in order to recover this, try to recover the garden. Next, please. So one of the first thing that we did was to, um, uh, to, to bring the, the original design, which was handmade to a digital format. And so we did, we, we transferred from the, the, for a digital format, um, a great number of the 50s the, uh, documents. Next. Um, then what we did, uh, we did a, a botanic research, finding out um, what species of trees and palms and are planted in the area and what are their location. And then we can compare these two, these two drawings on the left, the original Bulemax design for trees and shrubs. On the, on the right, the actual situation of the gardens. And we can see that, that it's completely unstructured and it doesn't, it doesn't show any, let's say, any cultivated um, thought about the, the, the trees. And another interesting information is that from the 160 trees, different species of trees that Bulemax specified, we have planted only, we have planted 34, not necessarily the same. And Bulemax specified 55 different species of palms and we can find now only two palms, two species of palms in the gardens, um, not necessarily the ones that he has specified. So it means that the diversity of the garden has lost a lot. Next, please. Um, Bole Max listed um, 1150 species of plants for the garden. It's it's a lot of information, uh, considering even his gardens, his other gardens. It's a lot, and it has an explanation for that. Uh, we we began studying the the trees and the palms. He specified it on 163 and 58 palm species. Uh, in, we, we worked with botanists in order to up to date the scientific names of the the this, this plants because from the 60s to nowadays the names have been changed all, around the years so we updated a lot of information and added a lot of information in order to understand what was behind this list. Christina, please next. And when we go to the graphic representation of the spreadsheet, it's interesting to, to see that he specified a, a high number of botanic families and botanic genus, which is also not usual for Bulemax gardens. Bulemax gardens, as we know, he usually designed large groups of the same trees of the, or the same plants as he did at the front garden of the university, you see strips with the same plant in order to highlight um, a characteristics of the plant, a flower, its structure, it, it leaves or something like that. And here he specified a lot. Next. When we see, when we put in this way, the graphical representation, we can see that you can see the huge number of trees that he specified only one, uh, only one tree for each species. Um, what does he have in mind actually? He, this, is, this has to do with his concept as the gardens for the faculty of architecture as being a place for study, for experimentation, for an opportunity to display trees and plant materials so uh, the students could have a small arboretum uh, at their disposal to add to their studies. Next. 
the same here when we have the when we count family and genus we can see although we can see the 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 biodiversity present in this list of plants although it was not a com biodiversity was not a concept I used at the time in landscape projects but it's interesting to know that it was there next and so based on the plants the original drawings we turn to the study of the shrubs and herbs so what do they say to us um uh, representing the way Bulemax used to represent was important for us to know the association of different plants and and different shrubs and herbs. And what did he try to what did he try in either in the front garden or in the experiential garden? Next, Kishin, please. So we did it. So we have here the two lab the representation of two levels, two layers of Bulemax designs for architectural gardens. On the left, we have the layer of trees and palms. And on the right, we have the layers of shrubs and herbs. And we can see how interesting it is because the, the smaller part, the front part, the one at the top was designed supposed to stay at, it was designed as Bulemax projects. They're not supposed to receive any change along the time. However, the, the design of the experimental gardens or pedagogical gardens where the plants were specified to, to change a long time uh, as the students and the teachers were using it as a, almost as a library. Next. Um, one of the things we did with the documents, with the collections of NPD was to study each section of Bulemax Gardens for the faculty. Um, as you can see at, at the experimental gardens, he organized um, spaces for different kinds of plants as a library. Um, and we studied each and every one of them in separate. Uh, and then we will show you two, just to to have a to have a, an idea of how the work is going. Next, please. So we're beginning with one of the courtyards that we call courtyards of philodendrus. We, um, philodendrus is um, is a, a shrub, very much used for Bulemax in his project. is a Brazilian is a native plant from um from the Atlantic forest and Bulemax introduced philodendrus in landscape design in um, in his early work it was not used in Brazilian gardens until Bulemax it was considered a plant of the forest it didn't have an ornamental value so Bulemax uh, decided to display a large number of philodendrons in this small courtyard for the students, architecture students, in order to, to display the aesthetic qualities of the plant. So this is the original drawing of the garden. Next, Christina, please. And here is uh, uh, our interpretation of the garden concerning colors, the way that Bulemax used to design it. And on the right, we studied every every plant that Bulemax is specified for this garden. We can see the philodendron. He has eight or nine different species of philodendron. Philodendron is this one with the big leaves. So we have big leaves. We have smaller leaves. We have um, it, it, it's it's in a fantastic um, plant for exploring the aesthetic possibilities of garden design. Next. This is the, an image of the courtyard as is it now. And here we have four drawings. The one at the top is the original one designed by Bulemax. The left is the one that we redesigned, understanding his, his, um, his design structure. You can see that uh, Bulemax didn't place the trees around the lake. Actually, we don't do it, otherwise it doesn't 
allow the sunshine to to illuminate the light and uh, this is what happens now the design on the middle is the 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 courtyard as it is now and on the left is our suggestion um, because we cannot remove the trees any longer it's not possible for us to remove the tea, the tree so this is a compromise uh, in order to adapt the original project to the existing situation. We decided to plant uh, only the smaller five trees at the left side, and we decided to plant all the other shrubs and herbs specified by him. Next, please. And here we have the experience, the, the experience of planting the original plants uh, specified by Bulemax, the courtyard, and, and we use this, this opportunity as a pedagogic activity involving students from architecture, from fine arts schools, involving lectures from these those schools and the university staff in this planting. It was a, an opportunity to highlight the importance of Bulemax's work and uh, to to highlight also the pedagogical object, pedagogical or one of the pedagogical objects of his project. Next, please. And here, the second one is the what the, the study of the plant nursery in Portuguese is Ripado, which is the largest building designed by Bule Max. To give an idea, it has 100 meters length and 40 meters high. Uh, so 40 meters high, no, sorry. Uh, how can I say? Sorry, I forgot the name. But it's a huge building. And let's see what was the idea, Bulemak's idea for this, for this nursery. Next, please. So this is um, the, the interpretation of Bulemak's list of plants and design for this working area. Mm, a nursery is actually a working area in for nurseries. Uh, here we have plants, we have pots, we have places to work, we have um, places for falling waters. So it is a it is an amazing. Um, in an amazing space for landscape for architecture students to you know to explore the plants possibilities next and he specified it at 365 species for this area it is, is an ongoing study of the plants of each and one of them that we are um that's still on plants these plants were specified only for this area. Next. So, so this is an idea of the other areas that we have studied they show, that shows the, the vibrant design that Bulemax, which is the hallmark of Bulemax landscape design. It's, it's vibrant, it, it shines, it's colorful. It's really a pity that we don't have even a shadow of what this work meant, uh, of what, what he thought of this work. Next. And, and this is the last image I would like to show you. It is, uh, we have been uh, thinking with students and other lectures what to do to update this proposal. Uh, how can we, how can we update the proposal considering also that the building is not only used for architecture faculty any longer. Now our faculty architecture share the building with fine art school and with uh, the planning, urban planning school. So it, they, have, they have other interests. They have um, a different think of how to use the, the area once it can be recovered as a garden again. And so we've we have been speculating with students how to update the garden, especially the experimental area, to our necessities, maintaining Bulemax spirit uh, and ideas on the process. 
This was an workshop that we had with students from masters in urbanism and landscape design, PhD in urbanism, and undergraduate students in architecture. Next. Finally, I would like to say that this work is has been developed for a lot of people. Uh, we have landscape architects, we have architects, historians, we have botanists, we have designers, um, majority from the faculty staff of the of our university. We also have a number of students the students from fine arts schools and from architecture. And so we are using this opportunity to think the renovation of Bulemax Gardens for the Faculty of Architecture as an opportunity to implement his idea of the garden as a place for experimentation of study and we are practicing it in the in this experience of renovating the gardens and for the experience there's no doubt that the all the npd collection has been extremely important in driving our actions towards this renovation thank you very much thank you thank you uh, lucia thank you maria cristina uh, I think we have a, a, a very, very interesting session today. So uh, it's open the, the questions and comments. I have a comment and uh, it's, it's incredible how the, the documental material uh, could, uh, uh, what can I say, could, could uh, have a different ways uh, to, to uh, have an, an an, an actual uh, importance, as uh, Isabel posted, is really interesting. Um, her work on on the museum uh, Solidarité Museum, uh, also that it because um, it was a kind of action like Lucia and Maria Cristina show us to uh, renovate the idea of the implementation of the museum as a, an, an, an actual museum and the collection. It is uh, already in, in the Museum of Solidarity uh, in, in Santiago. And also uh, the relation that Michel show us in between the idea of, of curating some uh, material to uh, have a very um, a very extended um, um, impact on the on the architectural culture, and also as Lucia and Maria Cristina show us, it is a very practical uh, issue on the documentation to restore, in part or or hope to do it, uh, the 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 garden, which is actually a very complicated thing because uh, people it's it's uh, it needs needs to care every day and as as Lucia show us with this patio all the plants are already there and we cannot take it out and so it's a very complicated things but the most interesting is the relation in between the documentation from the archives to put it in a different way which is uh, uh, today our main issue. Um, so we have uh, some minutes for comments. We have some uh, people in the in the Zoom. Uh, so let's go ahead with uh, some questions, or in between the the. The persons who are in, in who did the presentations also. Is there are some questions or comments. Yes. May I? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. Well, first of all, I will. I would like to thank um, 
uh, Isabelle and Michelle for their presentation. It was very, very interesting to know what's going on here around us in South America. We're so close and so far. And I would like to say that I, that concerning the, the architect, Jose Garcia Bryce, I was really impressed with the quality and the beauty of, of uh, his, of the drawings. And, uh, and I, I would like to have again the, how can I say that? QR, don't remember, that stuff that okay. we put. Yes, and not, not here at the, yes, QR code. Yeah. Not now, but maybe I can get in touch with you and have it later because it will be very important for us, for our students. And, and yes. it's an amazing collection. Uh, I will put the link in the in the chat that we okay. have for everyone here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I I think Michelle is doing a great job uh, by it, um, um, like uh, the, it's it's a it's what can I say? It's she's uh, starting some. Uh, uh, competitions to curate uh, the material of the uh, of the archive, and uh, it's uh, really impressive how you can. It started uh, if I'm wrong, but it started in, during the the pandemia, uh, the pandemic times. So she decided to do it in a in a virtual way, and it's really yeah. amazing how you can uh, make a, a huge uh, exhibition on the on the web yeah that's true in pandemic days we create this galeria virtual this this space online for exhibition and this garcia bryce exhibition was the first one and now we have uh i think um, um let me see so how one two three four Six exhibition with uh, the document of architecture archive. That's it's uh, and this one I, I make this. I create the, the exhibition of Garcia Bryce, but the other exhibition was a contest like uh, Horacio. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Yes, Carolina Maciel has. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, congratulations for all the amazing presentations. Um, I'm Carolina from Sordo Madalena Arquitectos um, from Mexico. And we also work with a historic archive of the architect Sordo Madalena. So, uh, like, I was really like amazed with all the information that you work with and what's happening also in other uh, places. So um, I, I have a question for Lucia. Uh, first of all, it was an incredible like use of information from the archive and to bring back to actual life and new design. Um, and also the collaboration with all the students, like it brings so much like new things. Um, so I don't know if there's a web page that we can see all the information that they are making or any like a place where we can watch more of this. Thank you, Carolina. Unfortunately, we don't have yet this online. Uh, we don't have this informa information online. Um, Christina and I, we are organizing a huge exhibition on Bulemax Gardens for our university campus, including both gardens for next year. But um, we we didn't thought of having it online. Perhaps we could do it, Christina, in a way or another. Yes, thank you very much for the question. We, we, we have to think of it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, Isabel, you wanna Wanna comment or 
the, the microphone, please. Um, I'm listening to the, the conference. I'm, I'm very interested about, you know, uh, the idea of uh, reactivate, reactivation archive, you know, not only reactivation, it's very interesting, the implemented idea with uh, the garden, you know, I think in, in relation with the music, how, uh, what we can do, you know, uh, with this kind of, um, projects that are not finished, you know, when, uh, what we can do with documents and this activity the archive uh, in relation with the question that the documents uh, provoke us. Um, I think in that, you know, it's, it's possible to put in another kind of case, you know, this kind of uh, methodology for uh, Reactivation methodology. It's not. I'm thinking about is it possible to put in the same way with Lucia Costa uh, approach with uh, this this garden archive. I am thinking only. This is not a question. It's a comment. Oh, about. I see. Sorry, I I couldn't understand you properly because there was a lot of echo on your voice, and I yeah. couldn't follow. Uh, yeah. I, I, Sorry, I couldn't follow you properly because of the echo. So I, I understood that, that you said it would be interesting to know different ways of of uh, reinterpreting the archives, is it? Yeah, I am thinking your presentation yes. about uh, how you implement this archive in a new project, you know, with the garden. And if it is possible to think in an unfinished museum, you know, like oh. we said, yeah, yeah, we can see all the documents, yeah. we see the proposal, but it's possible to reactivate, you know, the idea, the concept, or I am mean, thinking it's not a question really, it's a, a reflection I for me yes. in relation yes. with your yes. presentation that was really beautiful, you know, how to put yes. activity in activity, you know, the idea. I see, understood, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Lucia for the beautiful presentation. Thank you. Okay, there's some one comments or, or questions. I think it it was wonderful session uh, in relation with archives, but also in relation with the future of the archives. It's mm -hmm. not only this material inside the box. It's uh, actually uh, moving. Um, um moving uh, challenge challenging to do uh, different things with with the with the material also from also to uh, very practical issues or to the uh, architectural culture uh, well if there's no more questions or comments thank you so much i'm sorry because my my computer is dead it's already dead <laughs> so I'm only with the phone, and uh, this is the last uh, pre-event of the first series. I hope next year we can start again with this uh, wonderful uh, idea to implement uh, the communication and to present different uh, perspectives from different countries and different areas. Thank you so much to the followers. Thank you so much to the presenters. and. Uh, we are here for anything you can ask about the the 18 Docomomo conference to be held in Santiago in 2024. Thank you so much. Thank you, Horacio. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye.